Well, well, welcome to Lab Life with the Air Force Research Laboratory. Hi, I'm Michelle. And I'm Kenneth. Hello, folks. Today we are joined by Dr. Sean Phillips to discuss the Stubby Motor Test, our rocket propulsion lab, and the show Space Force. In three, two, one. Dr. Phillips, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Glad to be here, even virtually. Sweet. Right. Yeah. <laughs> New forum for, for meeting and recording these, but we've had quite a few guests on the podcast now, but we've really been waiting for the perfect one since Netflix's Space Force came out. And we think we found it in you because we we need to talk. <laughs> yes, we do. We definitely do. A, a great new series that did get pr- quite the critics reviews, but the fans uh, seem to be a big favorite or be a big favorite of the fans, including a lot of us at the AFRL Rocket Lab out here. Yeah. So yeah, you're you're in our rocket propulsion division, and you know I couldn't help as I was watching the series, and I'm pretty sure I'm not supposed to like endorse it right now, but I, I couldn't help seeing a little bit of my workplace in in the Space Force episodes. Like for example, they're out there looking for these like endangered lizards. Like, do you guys do that when you're launching stuff? Yeah, you know, there's there's a number of things in there that made us laugh. First of all, big fan of Steve Carell, so that was actually just fun to to watch that part. But uh, when you actually look at it, a couple of things really caught our eyes, and I think it really drew in a lot of people at the uh, in the rocket propulsion division out at Edwards too. Um, and one of them was, you know, that whole thing of the lizards because we actually have something called the endangered desert tortoises. And so what happens is, no kidding, before tests and before we do other things, we have to have people that go out there and we have a biologist from Edwards Air Force Base that comes out and um, look for them to make sure that there's no no harm will become of them when we actually do rocket testing. So when we saw that, we went, how did they get that information? That was pretty interesting. And then I thought that was one. And then the other one that you talked about, you know, you're a part of with uh, one of our folks, Joy Alec, you were part of the uh, the whole um, green propellant infusion mission that we'll talk about probably later at some time. And uh, they started talking about this, you know, rosé colored uh, um, propellant. And actually our new green propellant is, you know, that rosé color. So there's, I, I I know a lot of our stuff that we talk about is public release here, which is good, but they're, they seem to be latching onto those things. <laughs> It's kind of suspicious. Like, did you see anybody who looked kind of like Steve Carell hanging around your office for a while? <laughs> no, no, no. They have a hard time getting on base, but uh, definitely no one that looked like him. Well, so I think we would have had a fan favorites. You know, we've had we've had other folks because we've had filming from Iron Man and Transformers out at our site and stuff like that. So Michael Bay and J.J. Abrams and all the, the the cast and everything like that. But we never got a request for uh, for Space Force, although I think it would be fun to to welcome them on site to do some filming. <laughs> Yeah, season two, or maybe meeting some tortoises or something out there. We're gonna have to get some B roll of that, Kenneth, for the for our fans on social media, so they can see the tortoise. <laughs> oh, I think they'd love it. <laughs> well, I was gonna say, and for the record, so they were talking about the skinny fuel, that rose propellant, but yours actually, ours actually works, unlike in the show, right? <laughs> Yes, in fact, uh, um, something again, maybe for later too, is that it just finished its mission over a year long up in space, our first flight test of that green propellant, which looks rosé color, and it performed phenomenally well, hit every one of its marks over the over the year of testing out in outer space through the NASA GPM mission. Pretty cool. So, Yeah, and what I remember about that particular propellant was, you know, it, it takes a long time to develop these things and actually get them to space, you know, decades really, but you know, you go from something that's really toxic, needing being in like full up hazmat suit to, to handle to, hey, if you spilt this propellant on your skin, your bare skin, you, you'd you be fine. You need to rinse it off, right? It, it's just really totally different. Yeah, and it's even higher performance, but you hit it. The big thing about this is everything we've been used for the chemical society, our side of space propulsion has been with toxic propellants, nitrogen tetroxide and hydrazine. These are things that acidify your lungs, gel your lungs. These are things you don't want on you. And this propellant, why it's still a chemical, right, that's out there. We talk about what happens when you have a spill. The other one, full hazmat suits, just what you talked about, you know, these scuba suits you're just kind of walking around in. And with this right here, they had a slight spill near the launch pad. And what you do is you spray it down with a little bit of water, dab it up with a, a little bit of a wipe of some kind or whatever else, and then it's fine. And that's what we want. So it's kind of cool that we've actually gone from something extremely toxic to something that is easy to handle and safe to handle while being higher performance. That's pretty amazing. Just one example of the work you do out uh, for AFRL at, at our Edwards Air Force Base location. So now we step back. Now, how did you become the chief of our rocket propulsion division? Yeah, I think it was a, an intense combination of everybody else running away from the job 
and uh, and me not moving too fast. But <laughs> with that being said, it all really did start, uh, you know, way I think way back on actually my family life and where we where we are going as a family. And so um, my wife is wife is third generation LA Mexican, and we made a commitment to make you know to to stay in the local area. And so when you look at what can be done and what places you have, really it was growing, just moving up the ladder in AFRL, the Air Force Research Lab since 1998, starting as a group lead, then a branch lead of science, then a branch lead of engineering, being the deputy for the division and then kind of taking that role and really wanting to lead the rocket propulsion division in the new direction and where it's needed for the future. That's kind of the exciting part for me. And that's how, how I, I kind of took it in steps I was really excited to get there and learn along the way. So in getting this position, um, I know a major part of your career was in chemistry. Um, how did that really prepare you for where you're at now? Well, I think I think uh, uh, kind of a, a funny backdrop to that is uh, I remember when my wife and I, we were in Delaware working at, I was working at DuPont. She was getting her advanced degree in biology. And we came back to California for family reasons. And when we came back, I said, okay, I'll, I'll just go from working at DuPont, the experimental station in Delaware, easy transition over to the rocket lab was a great, looked like a really great place to, to work. I jump in there. And really, I remember the first week on the job, I'm sitting there, people say, okay, you're gonna be working with high temperature polymers. I'm like, yeah, I've done that. I've worked in, in, in catalysis chemistry, working on polymers, DuPont, you know, two, 300 degrees C, you know, not a big problem. They said, no, no, you're talking two to 4,000 degrees C. And I went, well, nothing survives that. And they're like, exactly. And that's where I had to start learning about things that went beyond just the synthetic chemistry that I was used to doing and into all these other different aspects, which includes ablation, but also includes engineering. And so I think that helped me prepare to understand that my life was no longer going to be as a chemist as I went down this path. It was going to be a technologist or, you know, our technology manager and looking at the aspects of both science engineering and how they meld together to actually get you to a product that the warfighter needs. And that's something that we've heard a lot is that a lot of people may get to the lab and when they um, finally arrive saying, hey, I'm ready to do work. You hear about this almost sounds like an impossible task. Like, hey, we're working on this. And you're like, what? Is that how that works? Like, well, you're going to find out how it works. And that, that makes things really exciting. So how have you found, has that challenge really helped push you kind of to where you are now, like having these almost uh, milestones to get past? Yeah, it really has. You know, when you talk about like with, a, for example, a liquid rocket engine, you look at the, the thermal environments and the pressures that you're dealing with. You look at that and say, it, that is an environment and the conditions you have that almost no material can survive. So it becomes a combination of material, technology, science, but also engineering to be able to handle the, the loads and pressures, the heat, et cetera. And so it became, as like you said, like just what you said, this big challenge is just exciting. One of the things I love about AFRL, and, and just so you know, I only planned to be here six months and now I'm 22, 22 years into it. Really what came up to, came through this was when I was looking and saying, where else in the world would I have a job where I get to take on these things and have the biggest challenges in front of us and try to handle it all? And that's really been the fun thing for, I think, a lot of the researchers, a lot of the program managers and the test engineers at the site, too. And all the support people is every day is different, but every day is a new challenge. There's, there's nothing easy. Um, and that to me, that is just pure excitement. That's what I love to do. And you're talking about how, you know, how exciting your work is and the amazing people you get to work with. And I mean, if you think if we go back to our Space Force analogy, the TV show, there's a lot of like brilliant people in the room there. I mean, some crazy people, too, you know, especially the guy that does all their their Twitter work. So I don't know what it says about Ken and me, but uh, behind the scenes. But uh, what are some of the amazing stuff that happens at our rocket propulsion division? What kind of environment do you work in every day and what are some of your your mission sets? That, oh, I love that. Yeah. So, so you're absolutely right about that whole thing about the crazies because we call ourselves either the desert rats or other things like that. You know, they throw us on the desert for a reason because you have all these, uh, um, not me, but our people that are brilliant scientists and engineers working on things. And, and I think the, the, some of the things that just amaze me do come out of just uh, what, what we've talked about. Um, before, when one of them was, as, as I mentioned right now, that green propellant infusion mission to actually take a brand new, you know, chemical feedstock, a propellant feedstock, and actually have it fly. That took a lot of a lot of things, even just beyond the technology and the science. A lot of crazy work and a lot of crazy things you have to do. But the other one too is, um, if you look at it, is I believe at the end of July we have a on the AFRL Facebook page the uh, video of our stubby motor firing. And, you know, you're talking about a motor that's up to about a thousand pounds and generating anywhere from, you know, 3000 to 10,000 pounds of thrust. And you have to do that in the middle of the desert. You know, you're actually talking about that size of something that's out there. And so 
I think the thing is amazing when you see that fire and you look at that, just think about the scale of that thing being, you know, being pretty much the size of a, I say the size of my, the, the height of my wife, but my, we're going to get in trouble for that. But right around there, and this thing has to be fired off. It blows you away, literally and figuratively, to actually see that type of thing happen. And I think, I think you do, we're very risk adverse. I think that's great. And the safety marks are just incredible, but it really is taking on those things and those challenges. I, I think that's the one of the exciting things that another exciting thing that we have out here is those type of successes to be able to say, we just developed in-house from beginning concept all the way to a demonstrator motor, everything you need to know for technology. Now that can be handed over to industry or to our, our customers for them to take the technology to the next level. That is just unbelievable. And I think that kind of speaks to the day-to-day -day activities at the site too. We have so many things going on. You, you hit it. We are a $10.2 billion facility sitting on 65 square miles of Edwards Air Force Base. Think about that. That's just amazing. The history comes from the fact that the engines that uh, put humankind on the moon were first tested at the rocket lab and developed by the Air Force, actually, the first engines. It's F-1 engines, but you had the D and E engines that were before that. The space shuttle main engines was actually precursors were the engines that actually an engine program developed here at the rocket lab. And then you start looking at things and say, did you know that uh, SpaceX's Starship is actually um, um, engines are based on a program that I, I had the pleasure of being the, the branch chief of when we were testing that, which was uh, the IPD program. There's so much history, but it changes all the time, too. You may be, as you know, watch it, let me go back. As AFRL, we are a rich personnel-based system, our workforce-based research and development organization. And what that means is that a lot of the people have multiple jobs and multiple research projects they're working on. So at one point, someone may be in the lab doing uh, um, work on fuels research. And then the next point, they may be helping um, a company actually understand some of the dynamics of their combustion products, et cetera, like that. So I think it's so diverse and the day-to-day -day jobs are so different in terms of what you do. That, that's the excitement of working at the site. It's just, it's always something different every day. And something you mentioned that I, I'd love to uh, elaborate with the viewers. Um, you mentioned the stubby test, which we did post a uh, the successful firing of and uh, the actual test itself on our social pages here just today uh, while we're filming. So uh, it'll obviously be past this point when people hear this. Um, can you talk about what's coming next with that? I know a big part we discussed during your talk for Streams of Your Success was about kind of that transition to industry, the fact that we can build everything in-house, like this huge win for AFRL is awesome. Uh, but what does uh, the future of Stubby look like? Oh, nice. Uh, so that, that gets a little challenging to try to describe succinctly, but I'll try here. So basically, it gave us the foundation um, that we have the capability to do something up to this size and scale for new technology. When you're talking about new composite cases, new nozzle technology, et cetera. And that fits into something we talked about last time, which is that rocket factory in a box. The fact is that the way that we do solid rocket motors has not changed a lot since the first days in the 1950s. So how do you change that? And that really comes into this whole idea that we're going to actually look at how do you build the different um, parts of a rocket in something like shipping containers. And what happens, the idea is there that now it's not a multi-billion dollar industry you have to get into, but we can have the rocket motor companies come in and even new ones that are trying to get into the area, be able to build these and build them rather quickly at low prices. So you can you can look at building a case in a, no kidding, the shipping container. You can look at building a nozzle inside there, pouring the propellant with, as opposed to using these traditional high shear, what we call cake batter mixers. You start looking at acoustic mixing and stuff. All this stuff can be done. And what that helps us for is rocket factory boxes. Also, you can rapidly make new missile systems, weapon systems, et cetera, that we need for the Air Force and be able to have counters to our adversaries rather quickly. So that's really where it's going at. The rocket factory or the stubby motor is a foundational capability that we've demonstrated now and allows us to lead to the next generation. What AFRL really should be doing, which is pushing the boundaries of how to build a rocket better. That's what we're looking at now. So are you saying with this rocket factory in a box, so I can get the visual. So basically, instead of having these huge facilities to create like a rocket motor, you're saying it, everything you need could be contained within a shipping container and then you could put that shipping container wherever you need to create the rocket? Absolutely. You caught it perfectly, Michelle. That's that's what we're looking at. And so the idea is that you could actually build those things. Now, obviously, you couldn't build a, a, a launch solid rocket motor in one shipping container. But if you're talking about missile systems or other things like that, you have that capability and you can build certain parts that you need or you can specialize that missile system, et cetera, like that. That's what we're really going for. And so you start off these shipping containers for the individual components, and then you start bringing it together for the overall missile system itself. So really what AFRL should be doing, we've been told we should be doing is pushing the boundaries of technology, taking the the art, and I like to say, taking the science fiction and turn it into 
the reality. And that's really what we're doing with this program. I love that. That really paints a, a wonderful image. And something for our viewers then, um, to help kind of explain a lot of this technology better, uh, there's a lot of confusion with some people between the differences of you know, solid rocket motors, uh, liquid motors, or what satellite propulsion looks like. Uh, so the question is for you then, is there a difference between all these three things? And what does that look like? Yes, there is a difference. And also some of the wording is more of a fun thing. So let's do the fun wording first. Okay. So uh, the first thing you always can tell if you're, if you're talking to a rocket engineer or rocket scientist is how they describe a liquid or solid propellant system. So a rocket. So if they say solid rocket motor engine or liquid rocket motor, then you know they're not a rocket scientist. Okay. So we always talk about the nuance. And I think this is just steeped in tradition that it is a solid rocket motor and a liquid rocket engine. OK. Um, and again, so you think about it just like your car engine. OK. Um, you know, it has liquids in it. You know, so that's that's kind of how we look at things. And so we'll get into the nuances of that next, which really is why is that? And so if you look at it, we have the three areas you talked about, which is uh, solid rocket motors, liquid rocket engines and satellite propulsion. A liquid rocket engine is just like your car. It takes a fuel, gasoline, and then takes an oxidizer. Your car takes air and then takes the oxygen from the air. We usually do something like condensed oxygen, so liquid oxygen as one of our fuel or as, a, as our oxidizer. And then it feeds it into some reaction chamber. And that can be a combustion chamber, a detonation chamber, whatever else. And so basically you have a lot of moving parts, a lot of fluid flow, a lot of a turbine, if you wanted to say it there, a pre burner to condition things. You have a lot of active parts inside there, and then it goes into the injector, and then of course it ignites. Okay, so so basically that's the, that's the the oversimplification of a liquid rocket engine. A solid rocket motor basically mix everything together like a cake mix, pour it inside of a case which can be steel or composite, and you fire it. Now that's another oversimplification, but basically your fuel and oxidizer already exist as solids inside the motor. So that's a solid rocket motor. Now in space, uh, our satellite propulsion or spacecraft propulsion gets a little more complicated. We tend to break it down into chemical and electrical, or electric propulsion, not electrical. So chemical propulsion are just like what you see when I talk with a solid rocket motor um, or even a liquid rocket engine. It's the chemistry of combustion or detonation. So liquid and oxygen are liquids, uh, the fuel and the propellant reacting, okay? But then we have that side, but on the electric propulsion side, you can have things like plasmas, ions, um, things like that that actually make it go. There's a lot of technology development with what we call Hall effect thrusters. There's ion thrusters. There's also now electro sprays that are out there. So it covers that area. And the way to think about this is for the chemical side, it moves you really fast, but doesn't last a long time. On the electric side, it gives you not, it doesn't give you as much power. So you move a lot slower, but it can last hundreds to a thousand times longer. So that's kind of a balance that we have for in space. And then of course, now you're dealing with things like nuclear thermal propulsion and a lot of things that NASA would specifically do for, if you want to call it research missions, now start becoming an interest to the Air Force as we, and the United States say, as we start transitioning to the Space Force and what type of things do we need for in space? So I hope, I hope that summarizes it nicely for you. If not, please ask more questions about it. No, I think that really captures it well. Like that, that's a great way for our viewers, at least, you know, the fundamental level to understand the difference. Because uh, you, as you've probably seen before, many people aren't really sure exactly which one a rocket scientist covers or even how that all uh, could be explained. So th that's very much appreciated. And um, with that, then, it's something you brought up a lot were motors um, and engines. So uh, there is a difference between those two, right? Yes. Yes, definitely there is. And the way, the way you can kind of look at that when you actually – I always like to say the the solid rocket motors, of course, we use for our nuclear systems and we use for tactical missiles quite often because it's a storable. You don't have to pump in any liquids or anything like that. You make it, you're ready, you're ready for it, and you can go. The problem with that, too, is there's very few shutoff switches when you turn on a solid rocket motor. Okay, There's people that are looking at how you actually can extinguish them, but in the reality for large systems, once it goes, it's like a road flare. It just keeps going. A liquid rocket engine, on their hand, has a lot more control, but there's also a lot more complexity inside of it, too. So when you look at our launch systems out there, a lot of them have liquid rocket engines at the core of it. The space shuttle did. The uh, the Saturn V did. If you look at uh, even our new systems that we have with the Atlas and Delta launch vehicles, and even the companies out there like SpaceX, like Blue Origin, like Maston Technology, like ABL, um, you have a lot of liquid rocket engine base. And then what happens a lot of times is they add solid rocket motors to the outside, as we call it, solid rocket motor strap-ons on the outside, that give you a lot of thrust, real quick thrust, to get you out of the Earth's gravity well. So in general, when you talk space access, you're usually talking liquid rocket engines. And when you're talking about missile systems and also our uh, ballistic missiles, you're traditionally talking about solid rocket motors, storables. Now, you just name dropped a bunch of different companies kind of that care about you know space access. And it, as you explain, motors and engines and stuff. Does AFRL partner with any of these folks or do they, do they come to us to, to learn or 
transition technology? So that was one of our big transitions about four or five years ago. So thanks for asking that one, Michelle, because I love this story. Um, when we looked at it for, for decades and decades, we were the world leaders in developing new liquid rocket engines for the nation and for space access. That was our job and our mission at AFRL out of Edwards. But what happened was with the commercialization of space, which I believe now there was over, I want to say it exceeded, and I know in 2000, 15 exceeded $9 billion commercial space. But basically what happened is there was a sh fundamental shift in wh what we do for rockets. Um, there is no, no longer there's a need of us doing the 10 to 15 year development cycles for a new liquid rocket engine. We have these billionaires that wanted to jump for it. And we talk about space access. It's not just the big, big engines now, now it's the small companies. So we looked at our site again with $10.2 billion, 65 square miles and said, if now commercial space is gonna be one that's dictating the pace of space access, what do we do to partner with them and get them to work with the DOD? So we developed as some of the first public-private partnerships. You hear about with NASA, but we're at the same time working with them on how to develop these public-private partnerships where we bring these companies into our site for the first time and work with them on advancing the technology to leverage what they're doing for the Air Force. And just to give you a feel for what that's done to us, we were typically for the last 20 years sitting at about 15 to 25% capacity at our site. Huge site, massive work out there. We are now at well over 75% with all the companies that are there working with us to actually advance um, space access. So we brought them in to work with them. And we found the two things they liked, of course, was the location and everything that we have out there to offer. But the second is AFRL subject matter experts. There's no one like that in the world. When you talk about specifics of understanding thermal issues with fuels, talking about combustion issues, or just understanding the combustion uh, chemistry and combustion engineering and how to engineer around that, all those different things. That's why they come to AFRL, and it's pretty cool to see that happening. So being the chief then, I know you have to like see a lot of these people, work with a lot of industry, and integrate with a lot of people. Um, what, how does your day look then, working with all these folks who may be at the test site and doing things like the stubby test? Is that kind of a, is it pretty hectic, or uh, could you describe that to us? Oh, so I think it's completely high energy. I won't lie to you. But all the people of my, at my site that are listening in will be like, uh, okay, Sean, you, you type on your computer all day and talk on the phones and in meetings. And that's the reality of being the division chief. So they, they get all the credit for the incredible work that's going on. Um, but is it hectic? Yeah, I usually tell people that I think the life of a division chief is pretty intense. You know, you sit there, and especially with us at home, you sit there in anywhere from four to eight hours, nine hours of meetings. And then you have the phone calls that last for hours. And then you have typically on a given day, 150 to 200 emails that you have to kind of get through to and try to balance all that. I enjoy it. It's high stress. I think that's why I really lost my hair. Okay. Um, but it really comes down to the, the day is just constant, fast paced almost at all times. But it really does come down to with everything I do, which is trying, trying to lead the area and everything else like that. It comes down to the people at the site who are really making everything possible. And that's the funnest thing that I get to do is to watch them work. And that's a beautiful thing you mentioned. Uh, we talked in a pre-interview, and I really wanted to touch on a quote I love that you said that ties directly into that. You mentioned that when it comes to work, it's all about the people and then the S&T. So you said the science comes from the people that you help bring into this team and really make the magic happen. So can you kind of describe what you meant by that? Yeah, yeah, definitely, Kenneth. I, I can. And, and it's something that uh, I'm smiling now. You can't see it, but I'm smiling right now because it is something that's pretty, pretty neat when you talk about the people. AFRL is a workforce R&D organization. So it's not just about contracts. It's not just about coordinating and organizing. It's a complex dynamic that includes 11,000 people. Everybody from the in-house researchers, the technicians, the, the mission support, all the way up to the program managers and then the leaders. And so what that really means is that because we do it that way, if you don't have the right people and the people aren't motivated and excited to do their job, then then it means nothing. You're going to get nowhere. You know, we can talk about technology all we want, but they're the ones that are making it happen. And, and I think I'll give you an example. Um, you know, four and a half years ago, four years ago, we completely transformed our entire organization, our site. We went the way that you probably hear things from Dr. Roper from um, Deputy Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition, talked about, you know, we need to be faster. We need to be more agile. We need to deliver products. And so... What we did is we looked at each one of our areas, which includes the solids, the liquids, the in-space propulsion, and we looked at all of our test facilities and capabilities and said, how do we align better with the pace that the Air Force needs and actually the transitions that they need? And so it wasn't us at the leadership level that said, now this is how we're going to do it. We took it down to the working level, which was so much fun, and they came up with the mission and the new vision of where they wanted to go. And then they went and sold it to all of us, and it was one of the Again, I keep on saying the funnest thing, so I'm probably getting, you're probably uh, getting sick of my words there, but it was so exciting to see 
what they came up with based on our expertise, our skill sets. We had a whole process for it. And so the direction that we've been moving in now really came from the workforce because they are the experts in the area. They know where things need to go. So I, I think I tell people, what do we do out here? Well, we really, AFRL is the crystal ball for the future for the entire DOD, the Air Force, et cetera, on what's needed for the warfighter. That's what we get to do. And we we can show, you know, thousands of transitions for with that, showing the success that we have been successful in predicting what the Air Force needs for the future. And it really, again, comes down to the people. So that's why I say people first, then the technology. That's everything. If you don't have the people, you don't have the technology. So, yeah. and just to talk about when we, when we say the Air Force now, we really mean the Department of the Air Force because AFRL is serving both the air and space forces. I don't want that to be lost on, on our listeners that you guys are, you know, directly working for, for our space force. Yeah, thanks. And, and that's a good point. We're still, uh, we're still working on the transition to be dual headed for space force and air force, but we're still doing that space force work, but that's exciting too. And, it, and for us, we're going to be a split organization. The rocket propulsion division is going to be part space force, part air force. But I think that change is exciting too. We have a new, a new vision or there's a new set out there what the Space Force is going to be and what direction they're going in. And we could be right at the front of that, actually helping carve out the research, the technology, the testing that they need for space access, for the satellite systems, working heavily with the Space Vehicles Directorate within AFRL on the new satellite systems they have. I think it's an exciting time. It's just fascinating for me to watch also and be a part of this transition to the Space Force. And and hopefully, like I said, season two of, of Space Force on Netflix will capture even more of what, what we're doing, the direction we're going in. We were teasing earlier and that our, obviously our listeners can't see, but you, you've shaved your head for kind reason to support um, a family member. But I mean, it really doesn't look a lot more like Dr. Mallory now, but, you know, the, the, the chief scientist there with his, not a lot of hair in his head. So I don't know if you're looking to cameo <laughs> or project that image, but. Yeah, and maybe and maybe that's it. You probably have heard too. We had a public announcement a couple months ago that we've teamed up with Blue Origin on the BE seven for the NASA lunar mission, where they're gonna be using our high altitude test facility. It's a big program. Well, the owner of Blue Origin, of course, is Amazon's Jeff Bezos. So I also thought maybe I could sneak in a free Amazon Prime or something like that by having my uh, my hair shaved and kind of looking like him. <laughs> Just kidding, yeah. I don't take freebies, but <laughs> <laughs> worth a shot <laughs> stunt doubling at least you know yeah and I, I have heard that the one thing we don't want to say which is so tempting is uh when we're working with them on that program which again is a, a public releasable program great thing is that uh, when we need equipment we should not ask if we can amazon prime it <laughs> yeah i feel like you can get some stairs <laughs> <laughs> So uh, it's really cool that you brought up a lot of, you know, the history of the uh, Rocket Lab and kind of what we've done to really help the industry as a whole and really be leaders, like you said, in space propulsion and beyond. We wanted to give you a chance then, kind of this open floor to talk about some of the major wins or major projects that you're really proud of either taking part of or that the Rocket Lab has completed in its lifespan. Ooh, thank you. I like that. Talking about the great work that people have done and actually pulling together for a, a deliverable almost as you talk about. So... Yeah, so the, the stubby test was one that we talked about because of where that goes in the future. But the other one that we did mention was the GPIM, the Green Propellant Infusion Mission. And so let me let me give you a little story about this. This is pretty amazing. And I think Michelle hit it perfectly, talking about the decades of work that it took. When you develop a completely new, in this case, chemical feedstock, or we call it propellant feedstock, that started at the, the, the fundamental level in the research laboratory here, working in collaboration with the US, United States Air Force Academy, believe it or not, um, a joint collaboration that started and said, what can we do to build and develop a new energetic fuel? And it all started with something called ionic liquids. I won't go too much in that detail. I'm a chemist. I love it. But I'll just kind of point out that basically they started looking at what can we do to make something that is non-toxic, that is a liquid at room temperature, we can kind of alter its properties and can be energetic. And as they worked towards that, the neat thing was there's a new chemical feedstock they built and they said, well, what do we do next? And probably the amazing thing that I got to see was our spacecraft propulsion branch said, we want that fuel. It wasn't forced by leadership and said, we're going to figure out how to make a thruster out of it. And they worked that. And then the next thing happened, once the thruster was done, we looked and said, well, right now the Air Force does not have a mission for it yet. But then we actually had some ex-alumni that were from the lab that actually went out to and worked for NASA. And NASA was looking for green fuels and said, hey, this is a fuel you want to do, but we're going to leave it open source. Let all these companies bid on it. Ball Aerospace, Aerospace One out of uh, out of Colorado, and uh, with Aerojet Rocket as a sub, who's been developing the thrusters. And all of a sudden, we actually have a system that no kidding was being developed for flight certification. And so it took a collaborative effort. And I'm so proud of the, the, the tie-ins and the relationship with NASA, with the companies that we had. And then all of a sudden, you get to see this thing take flight, and then hear and get feedback on 
or the results of the maneuvers and the testing, everything like that. And now you have a plethora of companies and I'll be honest with you, countries that are interested in that fuel. So that was one of our biggest transitions. I think, yeah, you know, that's one that that really, really, really uh, is easy to see and something that's exciting. But there's another one for you. Back in the 2000s, the, um, you know, before we had the big uh, introduction of new commercial space, we had a fundamental problem in the nation. And that was that we did not have the modeling simulation tools anymore for our liquid rocket engines. Okay. To understand those in our launch systems that had atrophied over the years. So we had two programs go forward that were test programs for liquid rocket engines, but really were modeling and simulation programs. And they brought in tons of MS tools and brought them up to date. And then we handed them out freely to every single U.S. certified DOD contractor to use. And once those programs were finished testing. And the neat thing is about that is that we have had to date over 140 transitions of that technology, of the, that modeling simulation suite. And we've given it to all the new commercial space that are actually US-based and actually certified to, to work on with government DOD um, contracts. And it's been a win that people just will never see. And that's part, partly part of what AFRL does do. We work behind the scenes sometimes to make sure the nation is ready for the next launch, the next system. So that's another one that I just look at and just smile at because we'll hear once every couple of months up, oh, this company just got the entire MS suite and now they're using it for their launch system or developing their liquid rocket engine. And that's what we were supposed to do. We needed the nation to be ready for that next, that next jump. And we didn't know the Space Force was going to come about, but the Space Force needs that space access and that capability. And we're helping them get there, which is really cool. Yeah, to show that you have like a direct impact on that and to really give people a suite to not only uh, you know, build and show their means of getting to the stars, but really making sure that's attainable is something to be not only proud of, but that's amazing. Not many people may have known that. Um, and I know you talked about it beforehand with GPIM, uh, talking about its successes. Uh, we, we talked about kind of going to touch on uh, kind of what the mission was. So are you able to talk about kind of what that success looked like and what the future of GPIM may be? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So the the it was really interesting to work with NASA because the, of uh, going through the actual flight preparation schedule, which takes years. Um, it was fun to see just what it took to go there. But then actually it was in space the test sequence that was done to actually show that the GPAM um, thrusters, but also the ascent fuel, which is our fuel, the air for fuel, that the ascent fuel performed as predicted. It went through thousands of, of uh, what we call IBIT, um, small thruster firings, just to make sure it could do the maneuvers it needed to, et cetera, and other things on, in space. So what we were getting were constant feedback of what happens when they perform certain thrusts and maneuvers, et cetera, like that throughout the whole thing. That was actually just absolutely amazing to sit there and get that information from NASA and from Ball Aerospace to show it. So, so where is it next? Well, the big thing there, of course, are DOD applications too for this that we that we won't discuss here. But the big one too is we decided that that has to be commercialized. Basically, you know, you look at different things, and part of what AFRS do with this technology is say is that something that becomes restricted to DOD use only. We call those things that are in the U.S. only. We call that ITAR restricted things like that. And we looked at this one and said, no, this needs to be out there for the entire world because we need it to be commercialized and we need it to be sustainable. So we made an active decision working with all the appropriate people to actually make that a public knowledge fuel. And then we'll look at the applications for the Air Force separately. So that's where it's going now is there's a lot of companies. Um, right now, they are U.S.-based that are actually working on the fuel, but working on developing all different types of thrusters for those fuels. And we have a lot of them on contract, too. And so we see this as replacing almost every monomethylhydrazine, those toxic uh, systems um, for the future. Um, and we're working hard for that, too. We're not just dropping it off now and say it's completed. Like I said, we we have industry partners that are doing the scale up of it. We have agreements in place, to actually, with other ones to develop new thrusters. And then we see the commercial entities, entities picking those up to use them for their satellite systems. It's really exciting kind of kind of narrative to to all of our, you know, SNEs and uh, technicians work to actually, you know, see this transition to to be commercialized. And, you know, because the Air Force is in the, in the business of, it isn't in the business of commercialization. So this is the transition plan. And um, if our listeners want to learn more about the ascent propellant, which I think is the, the acronym for, for this, um, we have a fact sheet on our website and stuff. They can check out afresearchlab.com. Yeah. Thanks about that, Michelle, too. Cause we, uh, you know, as you know, the air force, we are the masters of acronyms. And so sometimes I don't even know the acronyms full that, that we use. <laughs> so it's good that you have a healthy there. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to lie. I just looked it up. So it's <laughs> Advanced Spacecraft Energetic Non-Toxic Propellant. So Ascent. So someone came up with something cool there. So <laughs> Nice. 
Uh, anything else there? Yes, uh, something that I wanted to touch on before we kind of round out here. Um, now, our viewers got a taste of this when we had our conversation there for our Streets for Your Success call, but I'd love to hear you go more into one of your passions. Uh, you're a writer. Speaking of a lot of sci-fi and really cool uh, topics that we kind of discussed, uh, what got you into the writing sphere and kind of uh, what, what is it like to actually have a, to be a published writer? Yeah, I don't know if I talked about what got me into it. It's kind of a funny story. So as a kid, I used to actually, uh, and, and my wife, as she hears it, she's just going to cringe because I was a, I'm a true nerd. As a kid, I used to put together my own mag uh, um, newspaper articles with uh, in crayon that actually covered different things about you know sci-fi stories and stuff like that. And that was funny. But then I got to become a scientist, and it was more about writing papers and publications. Uh, one of my things was I was working heavily in the world of nanomaterials technology, and I had this really, really embarrassing dream of mine. And that was that I wanted at some point for someone to come to me and ask to write a book about nanomaterials for the, for the world, just about what does it mean, what's the impacts of nanotechnology, et cetera, like that. So I hadn't told anybody but my wife, and I was given a talk at actually my alma mater for a different reason, but UC Irvine for my PhD program. And a lady came up to me, and she goes, um, hi, I've, I've been following you around. I'm from Wiley Press. I thought, follow me around? Who would follow a scientist around? <laughs> so I was thinking, I'm like, I'm really confused. And I said, Wiley Press, yeah, I know what you do. She goes, yeah, we wanted to know if you would write a book um, for um, people that kind of explains to people who aren't scientists or engineers about what nanomaterials is. And I thought I was being pranked. You know, I really thought that someone was playing a joke on me. I'm like, well, the only person that knows my dream about this was my wife. So I actually uh, was excited about it and said, hey, we'll put you on a two-year stipend to write the book. I started like that. And that was pretty exciting for me. Um, and so I went and told my boss about it. And he said, hey, if you don't take the stipend, you can do it during work time because the benefit to the Air Force, you can use our resources, everything else like that. And I wasn't cared about the money. It was the whole thing. I got excited about it. So I was ready to accept. And then two weeks later, he walked into my office and said, I want you to run the liquid rocket engines branch. And I said, I'm a chemist. <laughs> he goes, I know. I want you to run that. I said, well, if I do that, I'm not going to be able to write this book. So I had to kind of take a step back and decide what I'd do for the future. And it goes back to what we talked about earlier. Um, I was talking a lot with my wife about it. And really, even though I love to be a scientist and everything else, at the heart of everything, it was all about the people. And so I decided I wanted to be a leader first. So I took that position. And then I said, I want to do something, though, because I love to write and I like to be creative. And so actually, I started just writing a book. And uh, the first book I wrote was called Dylan's Dream, Water and Earth. Please don't read it. It's on Amazon, but please don't read it. It's embarrassing how bad it is. But it was my first one. And it was just it was a stream of thought of how to write. And once it came out, there were some, there were some positives from a lot of uh, um, uh, young adults really liked it and everything like that. But it got me into how to write. So I started researching and studying how to write and how to write professionally. And it's just it's a creative avenue for me. So I'm into my fourth book now. And my goal was to finish it by my 50th birthday, which is next week. But I've kind of expanded it so that it's probably going to take to the end of the month. And that'll be out in December. But it really allows me to draw on the, the passion I have for science and discovery while being a, a leader in the organization, too. And, and quite frankly, also helps my skills for uh, crafting messages and other things like that for the Air Force. So so it's something that I think I'll, I'll take well into my retirement. And uh, with the success it's had so far, it probably will be something that I will do in retirement. But as a famous lit agent told me, and, and I won't say who she was, she said, if you want to quit your day job right now, you're not there yet, <laughs> she said. But she said, <laughs> in another you know, 10 years or so, she said, this you can make a living off of. And it was really funny. I love I love honesty. And I said, okay, yeah. Um, so that's that's the path that I'm on. And uh, um, the last one she gave rave reviews to. So I'm I'm moving in that direction. And uh, like I said, writing a sequel to that book actually right now. So it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's just something that uh, I can, you know, if I'm up late at night, I don't like to sleep a lot. If I have some free time or something like that, the family's away. I just love to sit down and write. What an inspiration, though, to uh, live your dream, really trying to find a way to write and put your thoughts on paper and that people are responding to it, like you said, in a very positive way. And uh, four books, that's amazing. Uh, so it, when you said like um, there's a lot of uh, different chances to write and you love trying to, you know, using your free time to do that. Um, have you been invited to go speak in any of these books anywhere or do you have any plans to later on to maybe have open readings? Yeah, you know what? I, I decided to explore that. And that, you know, I'm a scientist, so I, I was a natural born introvert. So it was really hard when I looked inside with my second book. It said, you know, 
doing the blog tours, doing the speaking engagements and stuff like that. And uh, um, it was really a difficult thing, but it was uh, it was humbling too. You know, to walk up to someone and say, hey, you know, I'd like to know if I could do this. And they're like, whoa, don't want anything to do with you. Get away. And you're like, oh, that's kind of mean. But then you see the inspirational moments where like at our Barnes and Noble, they put my books on display and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, uh, those type of things. And like I said, the blog tours really were a lot of fun and uh, completely caught me off guard with how you have to be on your toes to answer questions, but also the enthusiasm of the whole writers, guilds and stuff like that. And the the readers and listeners and just the 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 emails you get back from people. So yeah, so I'll probably with the fourth one, do the same thing, take time off of work um, and uh, do a couple of these uh, more, I think with COVID around probably will be a lot more blog tours and stuff like that. But it is a, it is a lot of fun to do those. And uh, I've learned a lot about how to hopefully speak dynamically <laughs> when I'm on something like this podcast, because I tell you, I have a very monotone, deep voice and it can really lull you to sleep. So I have, have to try to figure out ways to be a little more exciting as I, uh, as I convey my message. Well, I have to say, we, we've been really happy to have you on the podcast. Haven't, haven't gone to sleep at all. I do think I'm getting a little suspicious now. So you know about the des- desert tortoises and you know about this skinny fuel and you're a writer and all of a sudden these all these topics magically appear in a, in a sitcom. You, m- you might be our leak in, instead of the, the, the wily lady that was following you around knowing about, you know, nanomaterials or whatever she wanted you to write about. But uh, <laughs> so you, got you, thought, you thought about that. That's awesome. But I will say if, uh, if they come to me and they need someone for free to, uh, to help provide things that legally the air force allows us to, I gladly do it. So uh, um, that would be a lot of, a ton of fun. It kind of reminds me of uh, um, some of the questions I got when I was actually on a, uh, second to the Air Force uh, public affairs tour in New York City, where they warned me, they said, oh, you know, just remember, you're going to have some people asking you about alien, aliens. And uh, I certainly did when I gave the public speech about uh, about just liquid rocket engine rocket technology in the Air Force. So you have to get used to those things. <laughs> Absolutely. We leave most of the alien questions for a historian, but <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll keep you on backup. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us today. This was a lot of fun. Learned a lot. Oh, yeah. It was my pleasure, too. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I've been having a good time uh, working with you and uh, Kenneth uh, over the last month or so. So thanks for inviting me. Of course. This may not be the last we speak, too. So we'll definitely have our uh, viewers stay tuned. We'll see how they love the podcast. We sure did. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Make sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube at AF Research Lab. And remember, stay curious. Logging off.